Um, I would like to uh, say most welcome to this uh, World Toilet Day. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many faces here. Uh, last year, uh, we also had a celebration of the uh, uh, Toilet Day. And it was uh, about 30, uh, 35 people, uh, a dedicated crowd. And it's fantastic to see three times more people growing and growing. Uh, today, uh, the seminar is on sanitation for improving the life of women and children. And uh, it's, uh, it's a seminar that we will address to uh, see the life cycles of, um, of humans' lives. And, and we will break taboos and discuss about critical issues that actually change the lives of poor people. Uh, today we also have uh, three uh, distinguished guests. Archina Patkar, who is uh, the program manager of the uh, knowledge and uh, network uh, program in based in Geneva for the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative uh, Coalition, which is a platform and a partnership based at the UN in Geneva. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Patker is a leading development specialist in water and sanitation and supply, with a special interest also on health and education and women's rights and rural development. Uh, her, uh, she has since uh, 2010 helped um, to steer the organization about the importance of addressing uh, the human life cycle and, uh, uh, and its approaches to the basic services with the equity and inclusion at the center of the uh, work. Uh, she's also been key for in introducing uh, the management, um, sorry, the uh, menstrual hygiene management into the organization. And uh, she has also been successful in this, in addressing this in a larger scale, in, the, or in also uh, its work in the post-2015 uh, uh, post agenda. So, um, then we have also uh, Robert Chambers, Robert Chambers is uh, well known, I think, to this crowd. He has been active and mo one of the most influential persons uh, for development uh, studies uh, since the 80s and 90s. He is presently also under the Institute of Development Studies uh, under the University of Sussex in England. Uh, I think most of us uh, has a special relation to the work that Robert Chambers has done uh, under rural development, putting the last first, and also whose reality counts, putting the first last. And uh, I can't understate the importance that Robert has done for participatory development uh, praxis, uh, theory and discussion. And I think this has been uh, key for, for a whole generation of development worker in Sweden and elsewhere. But today uh, we will hear more about his work uh, because he's also part of the community-led total sanitation. Uh, with also another foot in nutrition and health. So uh, we will hear more about the relation about the stunting and uh, shit. And uh, the bias of development workers, uh, blind spots of uh, the core issues that needs to be addressed. And last but not least, 
uh, one of the partners that has arranged this seminar together, uh, Jelle Fredby, who's the head of the policy and program at the Water Aid here in Sweden. And uh, Water Aid is a federation uh, of, of the global water aid. And Trebi um, has leading the organization to a, a platform here in Sweden with decision makers, with policy makers. And for those who have missed this, oops, uh, there was an article in Dagens uh, Nyheter yesterday about uh, addressing to the new development cooperation minister, uh, don't flush the water and sanitation aid. And uh, she is also um, not only instrumental in the work here in Sweden, but also on the global stage, uh, in particular in addressing the... See that works uh, with uh, water, uh, support the water sanitation programs on the global, bilateral, and regional level. Uh, during 2014-2013, we had about 100% of our budget allocated towards our water programs. A great deal of it, about 70% of that focused on, uh, on wash, water sanitation and hygiene. Through organizations such as uh, uh, Water Aid, uh, UNICEF, uh, Water Sanitation Program, the World Bank um, Water Sanitation Program, also the, uh, um, the Water Supply Sanitation Collaborative Council, um, and uh, you can read more information about our water programs on the table there. We also have a lot of information on the internet. Um, this uh, work that we do and the support that we have is highly relevant not only for for SIDA water programs, but also as we're here today, highly relevant for for our all the programs that we support through, through for instance, health, uh, democracy and human rights, gender, environment, innovation programs, and, and I think you'll hear some of the presentations today and how we link this red thread to, to overall objectives of the Iron Corporation. Um, I will just want to take one minute also to say that in these global programs there are a number of colleagues who are highly important, and two of my here today, Sara Gasson and Johan Sundberg, who work with the with our global programs and whom I had the opportunity to, to arrange the seminar also with Food Water Aid. And um, if you have questions during the break or after the seminar, you're welcome to speak to us. And now I would like to hand it over to Guy. Thank you very yes, much. I will tell you about the hashtags. Yeah, sure. I've got my own, don't worry. Thank you. Okay, um, good morning, <coughs> or since this is World Toilet Day, I think that perhaps the appropriate greeting phrase would be to the loo. Um, so to loo to all of you this morning. Uh, and uh, my role here is basically just to be the moderator, and I have already been informed by the panelists and self that this is going to be quite a tough job. So my job will <coughs> more <coughs> rather rather than encouraging you to speak, uh, I would rather perhaps have to stop you from speaking. But um, I would like to uh, now invite the three eminent panelists to come up on the stage. And um, yeah, you can just sit on that side, I think. Uh, and as you are doing that, I uh, would like to inform you that you are all very much encouraged to take part of the discussions, of course, here and also through uh, being part of the larger virtual discussion that is being held over Twitter, for instance. So if you're a Twitterer, uh, you can find the hashtag, it's right behind Robert's back, hashtag WTD14 SIDA. Uh, and there are some details there if you want to log into the, to the Wi-Fi. So we'll see some of the tweets coming here as we go along. Uh, and, of course, the reason why we have you three fantastic uh, presenters here today is that we well, really want to, to, to engage in a discussion with you. So, therefore, each one of you will have roughly 20 minutes to talk, and then we'll save some, uh, some time for questions and discussions towards the end of each presentation. So, therefore, it's my pleasure to now hand over 
first to uh, Archana. So uh, I hope that you have uh, what you need in terms of audiovisual, etc. Thank you very much, David. Let me start by thanking you all for being here so bright and early. Um, but a special thank you to Johan, Marlena, Anna, Sarah, uh, for being supporters uh, from very early days, um, well before we started talking about this um, globally and particularly on World Toilet Day. Thank you to Sida uh, for making this issue center stage, bringing it up today. And thanks to WaterAid for having me here as well. Um, it's amazing to be here today. Um, yes? Exactly 10 years ago, let me figure this out first. <coughs> Can I just um, put it on? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly 10 years ago, in 2004, I was invited to a seminar on Russian schools, a global seminar with a lot of schools, <coughs> government, and practitioners from across the world in Oxford, uh, invited, organized by UNICEF. And my session was very euphemistically titled, Women's Issues in Water and Sanitation. We've come a really long way from that, um, I think, and it's so exciting to be able to stand up there and celebrate what is an inherent part of every woman and girl's biological makeup, rights, and indeed, um, the really reason we can perpetuate and um, continue humanity itself. So on World Toilet Day, let's celebrate this. Oops, didn't mean to do that. I just need to <coughs> um, I'm really envious of Robert because he's not using a PowerPoint. No, I am. Oh, you are. <laughs> so, I'm, okay, I'm using a PowerPoint just because I'm so passionate about the issue that I would go on and on and David would not be happy. So it's to help me organize uh, my thoughts and there's so much I would love to share, but I'm going to share a snapshot. And that's how I'm going to organize it, really talk about menstruation and energy, <coughs> the why, with a lot of photographs. <coughs> then move to really how we and others globally are working on this to break the silence. And lastly, to um, really ask you to join the Red Trend movement. Um, in 2010, rather late, but better late than never, the right to water and sanitation was finally ratified by the General Assembly, joining a host of rights that had water and sanitation inherent in them, but not explicit. From CEDAW to the right to work, to the uh, right to decent work and safe conditions of work, the right to equal wages for work, the right to education, the right to health, we have the right to water sanitation. But what does the right mean? I'm just flashing that up there. Because if you read the small print, like in medication, there's a lot more than the big print. And to make that right a reality, we really have to celebrate difference. Otherwise, water and sanitation for all will de facto exclude almost 50% of the world's population in some way of the So this is what the right must keep in mind. Um, really, the life cycle, it's self-explanatory. We all go through this. Let's not talk about disability, really. I don't like that word. All of us have accidents. When I was pregnant with my twins, I couldn't squat, leave alone walk. So really, this happens to us at some point in our lives where it's really difficult to use facilities the way they're designed for a kind of robotic, adult, virile, young male. And it gets worse when you're a woman. And um, you reach puberty, and even before puberty. We talk a lot about the physical aspects, but the trauma, the stress, the anticipation, the fear of not knowing and then coping silently is something that has haunted many girls and women in developed and developing countries. I'm just going to flash you a series of photographs up here uh, that um, they're pretty recent, January this year. We undertook a 10-day 
photo shoot with you on TV in different parts of India, patriarchal north, Rajasthan, but also just one hour outside Mumbai. 22 million people, megapolis, middle income country. This is how women earn their living. Um, they're far away from anything you can call a home. Um, this is the employment guarantee scheme, 100 days per year, a per year guarantee to prevent people from starvation. They earn less than a dollar a day. There are no conditions to speak of at all. And those are brick kiln workers, violation of all rights, CEDAW, right to labor, right, uh, you know, um, rights of children, everything violated there. But this is how they work, and this is where they live. And of course, who hasn't seen this on um, a host of photographs on women and water? Uh, walking long distances when you're menstruating. Can we even imagine, you know, carrying these loads? But it's not just South Asia where the issue has really gained traction. It's an issue across continents. The beautiful baobabs of Senegal hide, you know, the silence um, in West Africa and East Africa around this issue. That this is Kedugu. Getting there just uh, three months ago was no mean feat. Of course, this is far away from the land of sanitary towns or information or adverts with women cycling or uh, rollerblading in white clothes when they're menstruating. The issue is as resonant. Talking to women and girls, just providing the space, a volley of words opens up. They're so excited to be able to talk about it. Not always just to ask questions. They are coping anyway. But just to understand different mechanisms uh, that might improve their coping strategies, or even why really there is a silence around this issue. And of course, they're always very excited to share perceptions and taboos. And the perceptions and taboos are so different. From South Asia, where um, menstruation is associated with impurity, with dirt, uncleanliness, so that you cannot even, you cannot pray, you cannot touch food, and you cannot touch pickles because they go bad, to Africa, and this is West Africa, where um, a woman's ability to menstruate is linked to her fertility and fecundity. So if she stops menstruating, she is not much use anymore. In a culture where very often there are multiple wives, um, menopause has huge stigma associated to it. And as a result, a uh, disposal of uh, menstrual material is jealously uh, guarded so that nobody can cast an evil eye because there's a fear that if somebody else sees your menstrual blood, it could cause sterility and therefore you become useless. And this is uh, you know, a world far away from sanitary napkins. 70% of Indian women and girls use a cloth. Um, reuse it, wash it, dry it, reuse it. This is a photo from Gunj, uh, one of the world's, probably the world's largest reusable sanitary towel maker. They use old clothes, disinfect them, but they all uh, to make sanitary towels and they also teach women and girls how to make this in an affordable way in their homes. In West Africa, um, the materials, uh, the material of choice is cloth unless people are traveling. But it gets worse when you talk to um, communities or individuals who are really, really marginalized. Uh, begging is an institutional, uh, institutionalized form of um, livelihood in many parts of West Africa. And talking to focus groups of beggars, they said that very often they resorted to pieces of mattress, foam mattress, uh, particularly disabled individuals because of the lack of access to material in a hurry. This cloth here costs 10 rupees, which is hmm, how much? Not even 10 cents. Um, and is a felt red piece used by most women and girls today in Rajasthan. This photograph is from March 2014. Um, you can imagine, just imagine a piece of felt next to your skin trying to absorb the blood. That's how far away we are from the world of adverts and pads in reality. And disposal, it's not good enough to just call this an environmental issue. 
most women and girls furtively get rid of the material as part of the silence of the cycle of silence. They don't want to be seen getting rid of it, so it's burning, throwing into running water, or basically digging a shallow <coughs> hole as soon as possible to get rid of it. And this is very much linked to dignity. We cannot just talk about pads and managing safely with water sanitation and soap if we also do not provide dignified disposal. Okay, so breaking the silence, what can we do? Um, I'm going to share with you very quickly our own efforts, a small piece of the global efforts to uh, break the silence and really make a difference. Uh, we started off uh, in 2012 uh, with a carnival across five states to really test, is this just small focus groups or is this a demand at scale? We spoke to 12,000 women and girls across 51 days in five northern patriarchal states of India. And the response was overwhelming from girls and women. This is a traveling carnival. We were so scared that no one would come. We offered free tea. But we were thronged. And we had to have dancers to keep people in order. Um, this is what we did. We, have, uh, we offered a safe space where um, first we listened. Then we had an interaction uh, where we tried to answer some of the questions, but also asked focus group members to answer the questions amongst themselves by age. We had prepubescent, uh, pubescent girls, uh, and we also had mothers. And on the second and third days, we also had grandmothers, because the girls would go back and send their grandmothers who had never had a chance to ask these questions. Most importantly, when the boys saw that this was a women-only space, they clamored to be let in, couldn't let them in. So we created focus groups on the sides with makeshift tables. That's about demand. Um, the third bit was really uh, the basic one-on-one -on -one of safe washing, uh, personal hygiene, drying, and reuse, particularly, but also making their own pads. And lastly, the pledge, which you know more about. So those are some of the uh, photographs from inside the lab. And this is what they said. Everyone faced huge restrictions. The fear and trauma before reaching your first period was just widespread. Some girls thought they were going to die. There were accidents, fear, trauma. Our overwhelming question from all this was why. And we just came away so convinced that we really had to do something about this at scale. This was the resounding evidence of work that some of us have done over the past 15 years in small focus groups across the world. Just not understanding why in education and health, in water and sanitation, why there was silence around this. They were asking the same question. So if half of humanity is asking this question, surely there's something wrong. Um, we ended with this pledge because we felt and we still, I still really believe this. You can have projects, you can have programs, but the only way to really get rid of a silence is to create a movement where every single individual will commit to talking to at least 10 more. So that's how the lab ended. Um, as I said, we did not forget the men in menstruation. From the minister at the time uh, of the government of India, you see him on the right there, a suave, slick, sharpshooting politician who said, what is this all about? So we said, well, why don't you come in, talk to the girls, and then also talk to your wife. Um, and, you know, uh, I'll show you later what that resulted in. Um, so our approach, it's three-pronged. We don't believe that we should be just talking about pads or just talking about menstruation without really responding to need, but also then linking to environmentally safe disposal. And what you see on the right-hand side is a set of tools developed, which the basis of which really is that this is biological. Everyone, girls and boys, bodies change. I need to try and Oh, thank you. Just like this. Thank you. So everyone's body changes. This is not just a female thing. And this was through the testing, where boys told us about their wet dreams, about their fears, about not being able to talk to anybody. So everyone goes through this in adolescence. 
And these tools were, thank you. These tools were developed um, really as prompts, with, but they were designed with the people that we spoke to. And this is very much, this will um, resonate with a lot of the health professionals in the room. This is very much the cycle where you turn the wheel to understand what is happening in your body. Um, and the, the whole aim of this was really, let's look at what's happening inside, let's understand it, be proud of it, talk about it, and then see what we really need. Um, so that was South Asia. Fast forward to this year, 2014. Well, last year we had our first uh, workshop in West Africa for 16 countries on MHM. Resounding response. And this year on International Women's Day, we launched a program with UN Women in West Africa, with Senegal, Cameroon, and Niger. Same demands, same silence, same issues, really seeking to build the movement at scale. But I do want to uh, spend a few minutes. I'm in Sweden, and I'm so excited <laughs> that the Volvo Ocean Race this year, um, SCA's team, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce SCA. If somebody can help me. <laughs> OK, so um, one of the world's largest feminine hygiene and adult hygiene products company um, has an all-female member crew for the ocean race. And the team, their team for the race is menstrual hygiene management. So we entered into a partnership um, to really bring this globally because our work so far has been in developing countries, but the silence is not absent, nor is the trauma in developed. And this uh, is uh, uh, at the moment going on in Cape Town. It moves across the world, China, Brazil, and um, uh, new, it ends in Newport, New York. And the aim is really to have training, uh, workshops, talk to people locally, and really bring together a collection of stories because that's the best way to build the movement. So where are we today? The issues really gain traction. And I just want to talk about this on a personal level. And Johan, you might want to look away because <laughs> this is about different kinds of measurement. Yes, we have lots of measurement about um, you know, the numbers trained, etc. But I think the impact, the fact that we have this topic here today on World Toilet Day is impact on its own. It was inconceivable 10 years ago to be sitting here talking about this. But this is in Stockholm. It was also inconceivable to see this in policies written in without euphemisms. It's called menstrual hygiene management in the two or three countries that where we have seen policies change. This is huge, with budgets attached and with monitorable, measurable actions on the ground. So we've come a long way, but I really think this is how we must measure impact so that one day um, our children and grandchildren are going to say, um, you know, there was a time when it was a taboo. Isn't that really odd? And uh, uh, I mean, my children, my 18-year-old twins, keep asking me, what's the big deal? Just get over it, you know? It's, it's there, it's just something we need to live with. Let's deal with it and address it properly, like we do everything else. So the, let's talk about wha what we can do. We see this as a critical, critical red thread that can stitch together across these sectors a whole lot of issues <coughs> constraining women and girls from reaching their full potential. It's a huge health issue, epidemiologically, a, ri a whole host of risks of infections. And you might want to look later at some of these research um, studies that we've commissioned on labor wards, on households, but also on coping strategies and stress. They're all on the table on the side uh, that women face around sanitation and hygiene that is not designed with women in mind. Um, but it also stitches together a whole lot of other issues around girls, dropout, teachers' inability to teach fully. We keep talking about girls 
not being able to school, go to school, but female teacher ratios in developing countries are dismal as well. And of course, workplace, the environment, um, jobs, <coughs> and being able to be productive, but also really banishing the trauma as a part of women's rights, the right to be a woman with dignity and pride. So I'd like to end with my favorite, favorite quote. Written in, nine, uh, this was written by Gloria Steinem in 1978. 40 years later, this is still the most amazing, brilliant uh, piece of writing I can ever use to talk about menstruation. If, what if men could menstruate and women could not? Clearly, menstruation would become an enviable, worthy masculine event. Men would brag about how long and how much. Young boys would talk about it as the envied beginning of manhood. Gifts, religious ceremonies, family dinners, and stack, stack parties would mark the first menarche. To prevent monthly work loss among the powerful, Congress would fund a National Institute of Dysmenorrhea. Doctors would research much more about cramps. Sanitary supplies would be federally funded and free. Statistical surveys would show that men did better in sports and won more Olympic medals during these periods. <coughs> Generals, right-wing politicians, and religious fundamentalists would cite menstruation as proof that only men could serve God and country in combat and occupy high political office. Street guys would invent slang. He's a three-pad man and boast, yeah, man, I'm on the rack. <laughs> so let's take the pledge. Um, uh, I'm going to invite you all later to take a bracelet, break the silence, start talking about it, first of all at home. We also have a tattoo that you can mark on your arm so that when you leave this place, people are going to ask you, what's that? And you can talk about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ajana. It was a really, really, really wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I almost lost track of time, even, you know. So, but now we've got uh, some little time left for, for some questions and, and comments on what you have just heard. Now, I'd like to, to invite everyone here to, to yeah, come with some questions for Ajana um, based on the inspirational lecture that we had. So, yes, please. Hi, thank you very much, Ajna. My name is Paolo Chalma. I have um, um, one question, and, and you were referring to uh, when you were talking about India as uh, certain northern states which are patriarchal. Now, are there non patriarchal states as well in India? Uh, and and also, I really appreciate the, the linkage between um, awareness of men uh, and not only women. But, but in, in India, um, and, and globally, um, the, the sort of pre-menstrual um, is very much a, a, a mother-to-daughter kind of a dialogue. Do you, do you work um, with the dialogue between mother and daughter as well? And, and I'm especially uh, linking it to the taboo and stigma uh, aspects. Thanks, Paro. Uh, great question about are there any, not, are there any states that are not patriarchal? Uh, not really. <laughs> um, well, actually, yes, maybe Kerala, uh, you know, in terms of traditional and patriarchal um, uh, practices. But yes, patriarchy is there, not just in India, everywhere. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, but even on the plane to Stockholm, I was just looking at the percentage of women on the plane. You know, it's dismal. Uh, of course, a lot of business travelers. Um, it's not a holiday, so uh, not that I know of today, right? So um, it didn't have a lot of families, it had mainly business travelers. Um, so I don't think this is something we live with at the moment that I hope our grandchildren would not. Um, but um, just going back to the mother-daughter exchange, uh, and just to finish off that question, the reason we chose the northern states of Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and UP, and northern Maharashtra is because people told me it's impossible what you're doing. There will be a backlash. People will say this is Western imposed. 
uh, garbage that has no relevance in India. Well, I said, let's hear what Indian women and girls will have to say at scale. Let's look at thousands and thousands of voices, and that's why we chose those states. Um, the mother-daughter dialogue, yes and no. Um, we found it quite useful. We did a lot of testing before the carnival, of course, in you know, different scenarios. Um, we found it quite useful to keep the groups separate initially, and then bring them together only after the silence was broken. Because there are a lot of taboos between mother and daughter as well. One of the most frequent questions that we had was, can we have sex during menstruation? You know, from teenage girls. And they're not going to really open up um, in our society, in Indian society or even West African, in front of their mothers. And if you don't provide the free space and the complete confidence, it is impossible to move forward. So that's why we always started with that. I think also uh, on that side, Cecilia had a question. I mean, we can try to be brief. Maybe we can take one more question as well before we move on. Hi, Cecilia Chatterjee Martins from More Trade. Um, I followed the carnival quite closely as well, having relatives in, in India as well, where I've seen that many... In June was the first time that my relatives in India asked me about sanitation over lunch uh, in India. So we, I mean, even the middle class in India are starting to talk about sanitation, uh, which is good. I wanted to talk about, you work in communities. How do you see that you can work closely with government and with policies, especially in education, to make sure that this is also embedded within curricula in school? Thanks, Cecilia. Um, Cecilia is an old friend of Douglas. So, um, okay, we work first with government. I knocked off a few slides. I just wanted to show you actually the policy change in India that we brought about, which is now also in Senegal. Uh, where we work first with government alongside communities. So our approach is quite uh, deliberately two-pronged. We raise the voices from the community en masse, large numbers, with local media covering it in local languages. But at the same time, we are working closely with uh, the government, national government, to really look at their health, water sanitation, and education policies beyond Washington schools, actually. Because at the moment, it's very much Washington schools. What happens to colleges, you know, that's very primary, secondary. Um, uh, and uh, to change the policy so that there's a blessing and a framework at national level that meets the demand that is rising. You cannot do one without the other because you really do not get support. So all our training, um, the average training is 100 master trainers, 75 will be from government. Health, education, women and child, etc. And then about 25 will be activists, NGOs, other. Okay, let us have just one more. I think, Madeleine, Madeleine you, you will come also later after the coffee, so maybe you can... I see okay, someone here. One. My name is Rebecca, I'm from RFSU. Um, more and more Swedish women, young women, are using something called Young's Cop when the menstruation. Um, it's a, I think it's a rubber uh, thing that you put uh, inside uh, that collects um, the, the blood and you take it out and you clean it. And of course you need to have access to clean water to do that. But will, could this be a solution for some of these women too? Thanks. I actually love that. In um, my younger days, this wasn't you know, available easily in India. The silicone cup, is, uh, there are quite a few studies that show that it's, of course, environmentally extremely sound. But I need to remind you of something that some of you may have experienced, depending where you grew up, that menstruation is uh, intrinsically linked to sexuality. And therefore, the insertion of a, a foreign object is heavily discouraged in many cultures. In fact, the very fact that a, a girl stops being a child the moment she menstruates and her movements are restricted, everything changes in many cultures, the idea of a cup is just completely anathema. So that is, is going to take a long time. Along with the, you know, women will raise their voices and inform the market. That's how I see it. And then the products will flow uh, and women will make their choices. We just uh, do some more sexual education at yes. school. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I think that we should uh, leave this extremely fascinating and, and, and 
interesting uh, topic for now. I think we will have the possibility to come back, of course, after the, after the coffee break, where we'll have a longer time for discussion as well. So let's just give Archana uh, one more hand. So we are moving on from, uh, from the inability to speak about certain things to the inability to see certain things. So we'll hand over the floor to, to Robert Chambers, who... Um, is going to talk about wash women and children from blind spots to core concerns. Thank you. Um, it's, um, <coughs> is, is, is this working? Or do I use this? Uh, what? what do you prefer? I don't know. I'm going to walk around this one. Are they both working? Yes. Okay. Um, that's that. Um, could, I, could I start that by just asking who, who we are in the room? Um, who is from um, CEDAW? Who is from WaterAid? Who is from other NGOs? Very interesting. Um, who is from University or Research Institutes? Who have I forgotten? <laughs> I'm a journalist. A journalist? All right. How many journalists? No, no and you and you're something else as well. A company. A company from the private sector. Right, I, yes, great. you see that's that's a blind spot of mine. <laughs> <laughs> the private sector. Well, it's very good that you're here. Um, before I before I start, let me just mention that um, there are some materials out there um, from where I, I work in the um, CLTS Knowledge Hub at IDS, which is more than just CLTS. And there are various documents and things there. Do please take them if you would like to. Um, the one that's most relevant to today is this one, which is about um, disability, making CLTS um, inclusive. Um, and there is a whole series more, which is on the sheet which, which, which you've got. I thought I would mention this first before we get started. Also that there's a sheet going around, if you would like our bi-monthly newsletter, Please just put your email in there um, as legibly as you can, um, and we'll put you on, on the list of uh, bi monthly newsletters, which has links to these documents as they come out, because there's quite a series of them going to come out now. Uh, some of you will be um, familiar with the ERR. Are you? The ERR. The ERR is um, not the economic rate of return, it's the egocentric reminiscence ratio. <laughs> and this is the proportion of a person's speech which is devoted um, to their memories and their past. And there are five hypotheses. Um, it rises with age. It's higher among men than women. Um, on retirement, it leaps to a new high plateau. <laughs> it's higher in the evening than the morning. And it rises sharply with the consumption of alcohol. <laughs> uh, it's the morning, and I'm sober, unfortunately. But um, I'm, I'm extremely vulnerable on the others. <laughs> so I, I'm going to allow myself one reminiscence, which is that twice in my, in, my, in my life, I have been absolutely saved by CEDA. And in each case, it's been a letter. And in one case, it was a letter in the mid-90s from Gus Edgren. Does anybody know him? Gus Edgren. He was, he was head of, he, Gus was the um, head of policy 20 years ago. And that supported our work in, in, in PRA. And this time, it was a letter from Johan um, in January this year, I think it was, which saved our bacon. And, and others I know, but many of you were, were involved in that decision, which absolutely saved our bacon because my colleagues in our small little unit had already had letters from IDEA saying that they should be applying for other jobs. And we were actually beginning to wind down. And so we saved our bacon, and I, I want to pledge that we will do our very, very best um, to justify um, the confidence that you have had in us. So that's a bit of a, a thank you. Um, it was the, the wind up to, to coming here was, was really quite interesting. Our channel sent an absolutely brilliant email which Freud would have loved <laughs> yesterday, yesterday, which said, I 
very much loom forward to meeting you. <laughs> Total exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> but the other one is because because Nanny, who, who I work with, um, who helps me in all sorts of ways, we help one another. Um, Nanny was typing out the sheet that you that you've got. And she knew that I was absolutely apoplectic about the latest developments in, in Diffin about um, payment, payment by results, which I regard as sort of utter insanity, but never mind, that's another subject. And she knew that I was very upset about this. So when she was interpreting my writing, in, instead of what you've got written down there, she said, a chilling time to be alive. <laughs> but it's meant to be thrilling. <laughs> So I hope there won't be too many of these slips in what I'm going to say now. Um, <clears throat> throughout all this, I, the other thing that I, I, I want to say to you is that it is wonderful over the years how CEDA has again and again taken the lead in pushing um, subjects which have been under the radar, but have not been conspicuous. I mean, sexuality would be one of the most recent ones, but, but also, also other ones. And I think, I think in CEDA, if you well, forgive my saying this, as I've been watching over the last 30, 40 years, I think that you've had far bigger impact on international aid and international policy and government's policy than you really realize. Very, very big. And some of the most recent gems in your crown are even not known by some of the people in CEDA. And I'm going to be talking to the ministry about that this afternoon, so <coughs> I'll keep that under wrap. But now I better get started because I'm already <coughs> going to go. You used up too much time. <coughs> um, you, you've, got a, you've got a sheet here which is sort of outline. And this is partly arising out of a fascination that I have with, with blind spots generally. <coughs> what is it that we don't see? What is it that we don't study? What is it that's not on the agenda? If we look back over the last 20, 30 years, a whole series of things have come onto the agenda which weren't there before. And you're an absolutely classic case. Um, um, in, in terms of what you've been, been pushing. She's very, very modest, but I tell you, what Arjuna has achieved in India is spectacular. Um, the, the guidelines for the national sanitation um, policy has got menstrual hygiene management in it at least twice, three times. <laughs> um, it's a quite extraordinary achievement, and it is an enormous amount. And the young I'm student <laughs> uh, we will argue that one out later. Um, I'm your student. Um, but on the back of this, I was again, this is a bit of ERR. On the back, if you turn it over, um, you'll see a whole list which actually comes from 1983. Um, and it's about things which are first and things which are last. And the last things on the right hand side of things which tend not to get attention, professional attention, um, attention in aid, attention in policies. And if you go through it, if you, if you think about what we're all about today, which is part, part, of, part of the um, ship, that rural, animal or human, <coughs> organic, simple, small, unquantified, irregular, invisible or unseen, untidy, unpredictable, soft, dirty, smelly. Um, people poor, powerless, illiterate, female, child, dark skin, and then the location, outdoors, field, um, and remote and night. And all of these tend to apply to the subject that we're, that we're all about today. And it's amazing that it's taken so long for this to get so high up in the agenda, but it's brilliant that it's there. And at the end, I'm going to ask what next. Um, now, when you look at this list, is there anything that strikes you is not, is not on the list on the right-hand side? I mean, arising from what Archana was saying, Well, it's a bit unfair, isn't it? Yes? Sir, I was thinking maybe male should be put on the first side and female on the last side. Men should be put on the right. They should be right. I guess that this is what is, not what ought to be. <laughs> this is this is this is what is or was. Not not absolutely not. I mean, I completely agree with you, but it's not it's not what it is. Well, no, I think I think um, stigma and shame 
are two things which are not here, which really belong on the right-hand side, and which add to the agenda of things which ought to be looked at and studied. And that brings us to where we are today. If we look at the biases, these biases, <coughs> it's extraordinary how they compound one another. You get multiple interlocking biases. Now, if we, if we think about um, professions, for instance, and status among professions, um, if somebody says, I'm a water engineer in a cocktail party, you know, oh, how interesting, water, yes. And if somebody says, I'm, I'm a sanitation engineer, it's a conversation stopper. <laughs> So there's, there's something going on there, and I have a lot of trouble at home actually because this topic tends to come up at dinner time. And we've been on the verge of divorce, but I've taken a vow of abstinence now. And I think we're surviving. So there's there's that, and when you look at departments, if you if you look at a department, water and sanitation tend to be put together. Nine tenths of the budget goes to water. The water MDG is being achieved, at least on paper. Um, the sanitation MDG is nowhere near. And these reflect these biases operating right through the system at the professional and at the departmental level. And then when we get to the, to the personal level, we have issues around um, women and children, particularly, which is what, what we're concerned with today. If we start with, with, with women, I'm sorry <coughs> to talk about this, but I have been particularly shocked and appalled by what is inflicted by custom and by lack of sanitation on women in India. A lot of what I'm talking about I'm, is in India, but I don't really apologize for that. A lot of it applies elsewhere in the world, particularly in South Asia. I find it utterly utterly awful that women cannot, who haven't got toilets, cannot go during the day unless they've got somewhere very secretive and private. But if they're, if they're doing something in the day and anyone is passing, they will stand up and just stand there. Who's seen a woman in India just standing like that? You, know, you have. Just, just, standing, just standing like that. Who, who has seen women before dawn in India with their lotus walking out to shit. Yeah. They have to do it before dawn or after dark. And that means that they hold it in during the day. It means that a lot of women eat less and drink less so that they don't have to go out. It's incredible. It's just an awful, awful deprivation. And it's highly gendered because men, they can go anywhere at any time pretty well. I mean, how many people, how many of us been on a train entering an Indian city early in the morning and seen all the rows of male bottoms. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, but they're all men. You won't see a single, single woman. I think I've, in, in years I've worked in India, I think I've only twice seen a woman actually shitting and squatting in daylight. They just, they just on the whole, don't. It's, it's really, really terrible. It's the exposure, I mean, that's one thing, holding it, having to hold it in, and all the things that go with that. I'm very glad, particularly for pregnant women. Then there's um, the danger at night, and we know that there were these two, um, two girls who were, who were, were killed, raped and, raped and killed in India, but that's, that's why we got into the newspapers, but there are other cases almost all the time. There's been a study of violence after dark, women going... To, to public toilets in uh, Kibera, the biggest slum in, slum in Africa, and it's, it's a really, really big risk. And this is another thing, fear of violence is something which is going to prevent them from, from saying, well, I'll, I'll hold this in, I won't go. Or they'll find some other way of doing it, which is not very hygienic um, in the house. Then there's the problem, which a group of women told me about, actually, in, in, in Haryana. Um, because they've recently become open defecation free. And they said, well, it, it's been really, really difficult because if we need to go at night, we have to go with someone, with another woman. 
And if I'm caught really, really short, it's a 20 minute walk until we can get to the place where we do. And so I have to wake somebody up and get them to come with me to have good conditions. But this particular mother-in-law said, well, we were stupid enough to build a toilet on our own. But we know that the government is coming with a subsidy. So I'm not allowing my daughter-in-law to use the toilet. She has to go in the open so that we can show that she's going in the open so that we can get the subsidy. <laughs> <laughs> and there are quite a lot of um, other examples um, like that. Let me give you a, a scenario which has come to us through the work which we've been doing on community vector sanitation, which compounds a lot of these things. One of the issues is um, how and why is it that there are so many um, fecally transmitted infections among people in India. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come on to that as the subject. But I want to give you a scenario which is not just India. The scenario is this. It's the middle of the rains, which is a seasonal factor. The woman is busy either transplanting <coughs> or weeding, because these tend to be women's times. <coughs> extremely busy. In the early morning, she cooks food. She goes and spends the whole day working. She leaves the, the food over so that it can be eaten in the evening. The food is infected from her fingers or in some other way. By the evening, because it's hot and it's humid because it's in the middle of the rains, the bacteria have bred like anything. And this, this food is virtually poisoned. So then, it's eaten in the evening, and members of the family get diarrhea. They get diarrhea in the middle of the night. It's raining. So what do they do? They go outside, and we, we know this because people will admit this. They go outside, and they go almost immediately outside their house because it's, it's pissing the bread. Or the same thing with children and, and, ch and children's poop. And then, so their shit and all that infection is swimming around just outside their house. Now, they, they have um, various precautions, but usually someone will go out barefoot or will go out with their shoes and will trample the stuff back in. And in the crisis at that time of year, it's very, very difficult for people to take all the normal precautions. Four minutes. Um, well, you get the picture. <laughs> Well, let me, let me deal quite quickly with the nutrition question. Um, um, I'll, I'll go through these quite quickly. The, it, this is open defecation in the world. The big circle in the middle is in the 60% of the open defecation in the world and rising. These are the links between open defecation. The black is India, open defecation child undernutrition and poverty and there are many factors which link these together. This is the distribution of benefits in terms of increased toilet access by income decile in India, in rural India. Almost nothing, almost no improvement for the bottom uh, four or five deciles. The main improvements among the people who are better off. It's grossly skewed. This is the density of undernourished children per square kilometer in the world. Look at the Gangetic Basin. It stands out. Something like 40% of the people who defecate in the open in, 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 um, in the world are in, are in that area. And this is really dramatic because this is work by Dean Spears who's done a wonderful analysis of demographic and health surveys across the world and what it shows is this. Um, this is stunting, so this is high stunting and this is a, a function of open defecation and population density and when you put these two together here's India down here with the highest levels of stunting the largest populations and stuck, badly stuck. Well, if we 
think for a moment about um, children, before we come on to this, if we think about children, there's a very good note by Andres Hueso, who is the um, wash person in, in, in water aid. Um, he's done a very good note, which is, on your, which, is, which is called What to Do with Infant Poo. Because infant poo is a multiple last, if you think of it, and it's widely believed around the world, very widely believed, that it's harmless. It's actually more infective than adult poo. And, and yet, it's not dealt with adequately. There are a lot of studies which are wondering why wash interventions, sanitation interventions don't have a bigger effect. I think it's because there are multiple lines of causation, and this is one of them. And we've got to go on exploring these lasts, these lasts all the time. There are things which tend to get left out. Hand washing at one time was being left out quite seriously, as though building toilets was going to be enough. So you've, you've got that, and it's a very good, it's a very good read. If we think about um, the black box of undernutrition, we've we've got. This is the traditional view that undernutrition is to do with food. And so availability and access are the two big things. That's fine. I'm not, not against that. It's very important. But almost all the attention is here. The anal part, which is to do with shit, is to do with absorption, to do with antibodies, and to do with other allo, allos, Greek, for other, other pathogens. I won't go through the number of pathogens that there are. But what we do know beyond any reasonable doubt now is that the diarrheas are only the tip of the iceberg. But the diarrheas are measurable. So everybody loves the diarrheas because you can get numbers and then you can get statistics. But there's a thing called, in, who's heard of environmental enteropathy? Right, well, most of you have. Environmental enteropathy is a continuous condition which stunts children and adults for that matter, which is bacterial infection of the gut, which goes on all the time, which erodes the wall of the gut. <coughs> Normally we have things called villi hanging down there, and any one of us has got it. If it was spread out flat, I'm told it's the size of a tennis court, our small intestine, because of all these, the way, the way in which it's structured. What happens with environmental the EV, is that they get eroded. And so there's a smaller surface area for absorbing. <coughs> also, the gut becomes porous, which means that the bacteria get into the blood. So there is a continuous use of energy inside the child, continuous but unmeasurable use of energy inside the child, fighting the bacteria, making up the antibodies. And I won't go through the range of pathogens that there are, but there are really an extraordinary number um, that, that operate. So if we move on from that, to get towards a conclusion. <coughs> Where are we now in terms of blind spots? Women have been a blind spot. Children have been a blind spot. Women in terms particularly of their well-being. Children in terms of their nutrition particularly, leading to stunted populations. And I mean, many of you will know this, but people, populations that are stunted, their cognitive development is affected. Um, their immune systems are damaged for later in life. They're more vulnerable to obesity, strangely, in the, in the, middle, of, in the middle of life. They simply don't develop. They're not able to develop to their full potential. And this is happening to whole, this whole huge swathe um, in India. But where do we go from here? Well, are there other frontiers that are now multiple last that we've really not looked at. I'm just going to go through a very quick list in, in terms of possible ones um, here. And some of these are, are already on the map. I think the first one will be already on the map. The first one um, is, is peri perimenopause um, among, among women with flooding of blood, with sweats, which must be awful particularly awful for a woman um, in a very hot climate where there's very little water. 
And we don't hear much about it, at least I don't hear much about it in our society, because we've got, we've got water and water facilities. But I think that that's something that needs to be looked at. There are issues around who cleans the toilets, who fetches the water, who uses the toilets. Men have got to be focused on, as well as women. But the easy way out for men is to say, well, we do it for our wives, you know, looking, you know, in a slightly paternal way, we do it, you know, for respect and all the rest of it for our wives. The men themselves are stunting other people's children if they're still shitting in the open. There's a huge issue in India about women's awareness as well. More than half the women who defecate in the open believe that that is healthier for their children than having a toilet. That's come out of the North India recently. There are issues around sustainability, the emptying of toilets. This is a big concern in India because of all the pollution stuff. You know, they're not wanting to have to do anything about it. That's why they all want septic tanks, which is completely out of under range, but that's what people in North India, where that big blue mark was, that's what they want. They all want septic tanks, which is completely unrealistic. <coughs> Male motivation and practices have, have got to be have got to be tackled because it's got to be everybody. Children'ship is another one that needs. I've already mentioned um, zoonoses and cattle dung. What about infections from cattle dung? Where the best results have come from a randomized control trial, which was done, I think, well, with good CLTS in Mali, is the discovery that diarrheas were not affected very much, but um, stunting was reduced considerably, which is a startling, I know, you're looking puzzled and everyone's been puzzled. It's a startling finding, but in fact, with the CLTS, they cleaned up the environment generally. And the hypothesis is, that other faecally transmitted infections, FTIs, were reduced, particularly environmental enteropathy. But there's a big subject there for future research. And then there are issues around collective behavior change and norms. I am coming to a conclusion. And a question really to you, when you look at that list, when you add to that list, which is on the back of the sheet, are there other topics, other areas that we should be looking at but which are excluded from our vision because they're at night, because they affect women, because they affect um, Dalits or people who, who in various ways are low status. And HTPs, harmful traditional practices, but those are, those are coming up on the agenda and that's very, very good to do with collective behavior change. But I want to leave with you the question whether there's one really, really big blind spot which doesn't get the attention that it deserves. And I'm sure, I'm not sure that CEDA will not do anything about it. But I should be very surprised and absolutely delighted if you did. And that big blind spot is us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert. It was really, really, really inspiring. And uh, I noticed it wasn't really so much focusing on history as you had uh, warned us before. Because these, really, these questions are here today. And they are going to stay with us, hopefully not for so long. Maybe they will become history. Not too soon. Um, I think we still have uh, a little bit of time for some few questions. Please try to be as brief as possible so we can move on. There will also be time, of course, after this session. Yes? Thank you very much, Robert. Um, this, this is just an observation also by Chilak. When you showed, me, uh, showed us the, the map of undernutrition among the children, you showed us the South Asian map. And not the India. Now, India is, is, um, is of course more accessible for, for development workers. Uh, I have also worked like you in, in the South Asian region quite many years, and I get equally worried when I go to Bangladesh and Pakistan, for instance. And geographically, these are blind spots, and sure, India is a red alert, but that's probably because we have a different access to India. Um, is there any plan? I mean, it 
go about seeing us uh, around this world when it comes to these issues, but what about the rest of South Asia? Because the, the it's same procedure there early in the morning. You see you see uh, guys over there. That's the, these are predominantly Muslim countries. So what do we do? When it comes to this issue? Um, you have a question. It's a good um, question. I would, um, I, I just loved Robert's list at the end. And these issues are pervasive across South Asia. And I, I chose, oh my gosh, I, I chose um, two examples geographically just to show you the complete, you know, resonance across geographies. I chose Francophone West Africa because it's a blind spot for many donors as well. Um, you know, the English speaking world is much more accessible in terms of research and much more going on. So we chose to work deeply in Francophone Africa. But in South Asia, I chose India because we took India as a hub, knowing because of language and because of scale, there are efficiencies that could be achieved by working in India. If you can do it in India, you can do it across South Asia. So we have, the last three years, our Indian trainers, government activists, government people have been working in Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan is more difficult because of the political problems with visas, but whenever there are um, occasions in Nepal, really working with Pakistani parliamentarians to bring these issues out. And the issue that um, Robert mentioned uh, I really encourage you to take these papers if you can, because we commissioned a two-year research, which includes Bangladesh, um, on women's coping strategies, altered pa patterns of defecation in India and Bangladesh. So I just chose India as an example, but the issues resonate across. I must admit, though, uh, it would be probably even more difficult in some parts of Pakistan such as maybe SIN, to really bring about media partnerships the way we can in Bangladesh, Nepal, and India. Any more questions from the floor? Yeah, well, can I, can I oh, you want to add? Foot, foot, yeah. foot, foot, foot to that, that, um, <coughs> Bangladesh is now claiming only 4% rural open defecation. They have made huge um, progress, even if that fact if that figure is exaggerated. There has been huge progress in Bangladesh. I think it's partly because they're Muslim. Um, Muslims in India are taller than Hindus in India. Um, um, if you compare West Bengal with the higher, um, higher income level with Bangladesh and, and stature across the same socioeconomic group, the, the Bangladeshis are taller than, than the Bengalis from, the, from West Bengal. Um, I don't think there's the same degree of problem about pollution and purity with um, Muslims, where the Quran has got many, many things in the Quran are supporting cleanliness. The same problem that Hindus have. Mm. I mean, it, I think we might as well call a spade a spade. Yeah. I, I, this, I think this is the reality. And caste. I mean, the, 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 caste, the caste thing is a major impediment in India to ending open defecation. Final quick one now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, first of, all, um, first of all, thank you for two exceptional uh, presentations. And uh, uh, in what of place, um, uh, uh, you know, um, UN Women has a tiny, tiny presence there, one person really. But even in New York, it's women's issues widely. UNICEF is everything, but in Geneva it has a tiny little fundraising and emergencies presence. WHO is health, and the twain shall never meet. So we are working with all these agencies using MHM as an entry point. I'm going to give you two examples really quickly. You saw the UN Women example in West Africa and New York. We have a program, because that's how they work, with UN Women using MHM as an entry point to gender budgeting, to parliamentarians uh, really taking this on in health and education, but also the practice. But what I also find exciting is the normative agenda. 
What is the resonance and relevance of the UN today? Not much if you talk to uh, uh, national governments. Uh, certainly in my country, I never use the term UN because I'm not sure it would go down very well, you know. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a normative agenda that we could use, we could use platforms, but are we using them? And the example I'm going to give you is of uh, ILO's new work framework. They have reclassified work in a very exciting, dynamic way, where the five prongs of work include begging, which is institutionalized and recognized in many parts of Africa, but also people out of work. And then the ones you know, informal economy, marketplace, white collar. We are working with them to bring, bring women's wash issues into the regulatory guidelines for these different types of work patterns. You know, for beggars, for what are the conditions that need to be in place around human rights. And that includes basic conditions around water and sanitation that ensure decency and dignity. So that's just one example. Okay, thank you so much, both of you. And I think we can give uh, Robert uh, <laughs> have moved a bit from uh, 2004 when it was still a women's issue in water and sanitation. Uh, we've heard several examples now of how it, uh, well, it's just as much a men's issue, perhaps even more a man's issue in a way. Uh, many men are also com you know, calling the shots for what, 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 what happens or what doesn't happen. And one, of course, uh, area where we hope that things will be happening uh, is the uh, Sustainable Development Goals post-2015. So I think that, Janiek, you are going to uh, say a few words about these things in connection with what you do to the topic of the day. So, please, Janiek, please. And don't forget to Twitter, if you are uh, a Twitter. We'll collect some of the, the uh, IDs and, and questions that are coming through the Twitter flow. Uh, so we can come back to them after, after, the, after the coffee break. Thanks, David. Everyone, hello. And it's so good to see so many people here on this day. I'm very aware you've now been seated for more than an hour. And to give your legs some movement, I'd like to start with a question. How many of you went to the toilet this morning? Please stand up. Everyone who did. <laughs> Great. Everyone went to the toilet this morning. I hope the place you went was clean, safe, and that you were there alone. Or if you have small kids, they might have been there. <laughs> um, anyway, please sit down. Squat. This was a... <laughs> I hope it was a good moment for you. As we all know, 2.5 billion people do not have this luxury of going to safe, clean and private place, which is why we are here today, to acknowledge different aspects of this big problem, or the big opportunity to improve women and children's health and rights. Uh, as been said, I'm Jenny Freby, I'm from World Trade. Some of you that have not come across World Trade, we are an international organization that works across 26 countries in Asia and Africa, and we have presence in Sweden, in Canada, UK, Australia. There's a bit of a gift on the shares. When you were seated, you might have noticed a small bag, and in it you'll find some more information. The bag also contains a, a, a very brief report we are releasing today on World Toilet Day called Child of Mine, making the linkages even further. Also on the side, on the table on the side, we, I brought a few copies of our report from last year's World Toilet Day, which we did together with WHSCC on called We Can't Wait, if you need further reading for tonight. I'd like to start by quoting a lady I met a few weeks ago in one of the slum areas of New Delhi, India. Her name is Sunita. Sunita is one of the many workers of the Indian informal economy. She works by sorting garbage. She's a rag picker. 
Sunita has a few kids, I think four. The oldest one is 14. When we spoke, Sunita mentioned that, oh no, no way, sorry. She mentioned that she just recently married her daughter away. <coughs> Why? Because the area where they lived had no safe toilets. And she was so scared of this girl's safety when seeking a place to go in the evenings, as been said by both Robert and Makana. So she married her off. To what? To a new family, to a family that she now stays with. If we can take one moment to think about how many rights that are compromised by that action of marrying away a 40-year-old. <coughs> So what is the problem? If we all look at this child, I'm quite sure we will see, we will all answer very different to the question of what does this child need? We have several sectors represented in the room, several perspectives present. And I think we would all be right. A child does need a lot of things to grow up, to become healthy, to be developing its full potential. The major point though is without access to safe sanitation and hygiene, the risk is very high that this child does not survive her fifth birthday. If she's born, this born, baby is born in Ethiopia, and as you can see, she's, her, her, the, her conditions is, um, she's not in a crib, she's on the floor. If you're born in an environment without access to safe sanitation and hygiene, you're exposed to a number of pathogens and a cycle of risk starts at the day of birth and continues to have an impact on you as you grow up. One major, call, one major reason um, why we are here, or why sanitation is such a big issue and as a result of 2.5 million people lacking access to a safe place to go is that we have an enormous amount of children dying every year from diarrheal diseases. As Robert said, this is the easy piece to measure. This is the easy piece to measure and to speak about. I'll speak some more about the, the other diseases as well. But diarrheal deaths is something we can all refer to because we've all, I think, suffered from a diarrhea or two on a trip. So we can relate. The majority of the children dying in diarrhea does so in Africa. Another Another thing that repeated instances of diarrhea does to a child is that it makes it more vulnerable for other killer infections, like pneumonia. Pneumonia is the largest cause of death for children under five. It affects 15%, or 15 of child mortality is due to pneumonia. The good news is that this can be reduced by the simple act of hand washing. It can be reduced with 16% by by improving hand washing alone. Oh, sorry. So, if you survive your diarrheal episodes and your pneumonia, has this made you a stronger kid? Are you now well fit for starting school, for going on developing and growing? No, you're not. As Robert has spoken about, one of the important linkages between children's health and repeated diarrheal disease, diarrhea episodes, is that it impacts on the child's ability to absorb nutrients. Now, nutrition is a field which has a lot of a lot of underpinning and complex factors impacting on the nutritional status, as Robert so greatly shown with his box. The important thing here is that water sanitation and hygiene is very much a key aspect but often overlooked to improve nutrition and health. So what happens if a child has repeated episodes of diarrhea, of diarrhea before they turn two? It's very clear that this impacts on the child's ability to absorb nutrients and as a consequence there they will suffer from stunted growth. Stunted growth, for those of you who may not know, is very short height for age. So, every fourth child in the world suffers from stunted growth. The majority, as Robert said, in India. 
A few days ago, the Global Nutrition Report was launched. It's the first of its kind, and it has a lot of interesting read in it. One thing I want to highlight, though, is that it also stresses the importance of water sanitation and hygiene for improving nutrition. <laughs> now, diarrheal diseases is not the only thing impacting on the nutritional status of a child, but also wounds and infections caused by other diseases, neglected tropical diseases, for example. As said, one in four children was suffering from stunted growth last year. And 25% of this stunting can be attributed to having suffered from diarrheal episodes repeatedly before the age of two. Okay, let's go back to the baby born in Ethiopia. We saw in one of my first slides. Let's now imagine she's 10, she's quite happy, she's going to school. This is Gria, and she's 10, but she's, she, lives, she lives in Madagascar. Sanitation and hygiene continues to have a major impact for her life and health. Both Arkana and Robert has mentioned some of these aspects, but I'll just run through it. If Gria is in school, the impact of sanitation and hygiene is still very high on her ability to learn. If she has suffered, suffered from stunting, her cognitive development has been affected. So she has, she has a more difficult time to actually learn. If there's no toilet in the school or in the community, it will both impact on her ability to, to attend school and also to, in fact, um, it, it will impact on her learning environment as well. Also on the teacher's teaching environment. As Arkana has mentioned, menstrual hygiene management is something which has been overlooked, but I think by now, thanks to WSSCC and others, it's becoming very much a topic on the agenda, and it's addressed within schools and outside, I'd say. The small girl Ria has grown up, she's now in the teenage years, and this is how sanitation and hygiene is having a very high relevance for her continu continually. 800 million women and girls menstruate every day. And still, it's somehow a blind spot in some places. Um, just to relate to that, in Sweden, a few weeks ago, there was a show called Cobra, uh, a Swedish TV show which tried to make an episode about menstrual, uh, menstrual hygiene. I don't know if some of you saw it. But it got a lot of atten media attention. But I think still a lot of people are not very comfortable about it being shown. Beyond health, poor access to sanitation and hygiene also have an impact on children and girls and women's health, safety and dignity. If there's no toilet in the school, in the house, children are forced out to seek a place to go, and even women. Okay, I'll go back to Bria, the 10-year-old from Madagascar. She's now gone through her puberty. She's managed her menstrual hygiene well. She's now had her first child. <coughs> Sanitation and hygiene is still a very big and important factor for her health. If she had her child in a health facility or in, in her house, the conditions for giving birth um, is impacting on our health. If it was an unhygienic environment without access to hygiene or safe or clean water, um, the risk is high that both uh, Gria and the child suffer from infection at birth. The important thing here is that poor sanitation and hygiene within health facilities or households, where also women, a lot of women give birth today, impacts not only on their health at time of birth or their newborn's health, but also in health facilities, it also has an impact on the attractiveness of health facilities for getting women to facilities to give birth, which is also a very important factor for them surviving. Sepsis is a, a condition which, which is um, 
associated with poor hygiene when giving birth. And this is causing 8% of maternal mortality today and 16% of newborn mortality. Improving hygiene, sanitation and water at health facilities is and have been somewhat a blind spot, but I think it's gaining traction as a very key thing, an easy thing to do. Stunting that we spoke about, short height per age. If you were stunted as a child, this would also have an impact on you as a pregnant woman. Also on your baby. And this is one of the cruel things about stunting, that it passes on through a vicious circle the impacts of poor access to sanitation and hygiene. Your child is more likely to have a low birth weight, more likely to suffer from, um, from cognitive impairment, and will continue to suffer across the generation. A lot of things are important to mention here. There's so many health impacts that access to safe sanitation and hygiene do have. We've mentioned a few here. And I will not go through all of these, but all of them do affect the health of women and children. And I think all of them can be tackled and improved by improving access. And this is the important thing here. We haven't spoken anything about neglected tropical diseases today, but this is a big spare where good sanitation and hygiene is important to fight and eliminate some of those diseases. Okay, I hope by all, by now, all of you are very convinced of the importance of sanitation and hygiene for improving women and children's health. A few nods? Yeah. Okay, so why and how come do we still have health facilities without anywhere for staff to wash their hands or for women to wash up after giving birth? How come? It's because the water sanitation sector and the health sector have been operating in silos for too long. And it's now, it's overdue for integration. But it's really a good and opportune time for integrating those sectors more. Uh, I mentioned some of this, but the, there are a number of important reasons behind why we should integrate on a more programmatic level water sanitation and hygiene. Two minutes. Really? Okay. Let's skip this. <laughs> um, quickly, water aid is trying to do this. I want to quickly mention two examples. Uh, in Nepal, we're working with the Ministry of Health to um, increase knowledge among mothers uh, on the importance of hygiene. So we integrate hygiene promotion in immunization programs, routine immunization programs driven by the Ministry of Health. Right. This has proven a very interesting um, theme of work. Another piece of work we're doing right now is to assess, all, also together with the Ministry of Health of Tanzania and Zanzibar, the access to wash in maternity wards, and also to develop together with the Ministry develop an improvement plan that they will implement. Um, yeah. A number of things need to happen, obviously. We want no health facilities, household or school, without access to safe sanitation and hygiene. We also want hygiene training and promotion being done by health staff and health workers. And this needs to be taken on by the health sector to a large extent than what is happening today. So sustainable development goals. Is there an opportunity for change? Some of you might have worked within this process for the last few years. It's been going on since 2012. It's the new set of goals that will take on where the Millennium Development Goal ends. And they will come in place by September 2015 is the hope. Sustainable development goals is a bit of a, it's a myriad of processes. There's been UN consultations, there's been thematic consultations, there's been country consultations and dialogues, business, NGOs, governments, everyone has been involved. This is a bit of the schedule of how the consultations have been taking place the last few years. <coughs> Bottom line is though that in January this year, 
the member state negotiations will start for real. And this is where UN member states, including Sweden, will go through the negotiation table to set, sit down and together agree on how the new development goals will look like. So, just briefly then, we hope that when they do meet in September 2015, that the UN member states agree on a very ambitious and universal agenda. We hope that there's a goal agreed on universal access to water, sanitation and hygiene, but under the water and sanitation goal, including water resource management, of course. We hope that the targets are specifically mentioning non-household settings, which means health facilities and schools. This is needed to have in the targets, because as you know, what is not measured is not getting done. So we hope for very um, strong targets, and also um, we hope for a target around sustainability to be included, and also about evening out the inequalities in access which are today persisting in terms of water sanitation and hygiene. In our opinion, ending extreme poverty, which is to be the ultimate goal of the new sustainable development goals, ending extreme poverty by 2030 will not be possible <coughs> without having an, an ambitious, uh, ambitious goal for water sanitation. We also want water sanitation and hygiene targets to be embedded under other sustainable development goals, such as health, such as education. Be water sanitation and hygiene being such instrumental aspects of driving health, of driving and improving education, it needs to be in there to get done. So what about Sweden? Uh, how many minutes? One minute, okay. What about Sweden? What can we do? Or what are we doing? As some of you know, of course, everyone from SIDA knows, I hope, but for some of you others, um, water sanitation and hygiene have been moved and tied closer to health during the last years. It's been tied closer to women's and children's health, policy-wise, and I think in programmatic senses as well. This is very important and this needs to continue. The previous government, we had an election in September and we had a new government as of then. The previous government did a whole lot of work to put in place a policy platform for aid with resource strategies. Within that platform, water sanitation was placed under a goal of health, improving health. Also in the previous government's post-2015 position, water and sanitation was one of the 10 key priorities. The new government has said they will review both the platform and the post-2015 position. <coughs> so it's all to play for, but we do not know yet where it will end. But our hope is, of course, that the new government do see the value of con continuing to make um, women and children's health a priority and to continue to enforce the linkages between water sanitation and hygiene and this. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was really good also to hear that, uh, you know, We've heard a lot of the issues, uh, and you're really working with these issues, and you have been working with them. Uh, and you also throw out a couple of questions to uh, the Swedish government and to CEDA, how they can work with these issues. Because, as we, as we said, we, we're going to have to work with these issues for quite some time to make them history. Uh, do we have... I think that before we're going on a co short coffee break, I think that uh, there could be time for uh, at least one question or so. Uh, if you'd like to ask Jenny something right now. Um, if you are not going to take this opportunity, I'm not going to let you go away for the coffee anyway. <laughs> so, 
Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be okay. And my name is Nadia Kudde, and uh, I have uh, some years of experience in the sector. Uh, so uh, uh, my question to Yanni and to Sita and everyone else is that we, we have actually worked in collaboration with health for a long time. We have not been so successful. So is this the way to go, or should we go with other sectors? My question is over the next mm -hmm. session. Other sectors. Private sector, maybe entertainment industry, <laughs> why not? Agriculture? Agriculture. I, I think there's, I mean, there's no need to limit yourselves. Go with any sector that yeah. where water sanitation and hygiene does have an impact. So yes, let's spread across the whole uh, spectrum, I'd say. Yeah. I think we should do that. Um, and I also think that we actually can come back to all these issues after the short coffee break. So shall we just give Jenny a, a warm hand again? <laughs>